Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day in which to gather and worship you. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your Spirit on this place, that you would pour out your Spirit on each and every one of us, that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word, to your will, to your call upon us, that we might hear from you, that we might be led and guided by you, that when we leave this place today, we might leave ready to do whatever it is that you're calling each and every one of us to do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is our last uh, in this series that we have been doing on grace. And if you haven't gotten the concept yet, now, grace is really a huge concept. And, and really, I think on some level, it is so counterintuitive to who we are as human beings that it's very hard for even us who have been in the church for a long time to really wrap our heads around grace, around the fact that, as, as I mentioned before our prayer of confession, that while we were still in the midst of our sin, while we were still rebelling against God, that He would come, that He would die for us, that that he would forgive us. It, it's really not in our nature to forgive people like that. We, we, want, we want justice. We, we want to get even. But God is a God of grace. And that's, that's what's so amazing about this concept is that it has nothing to do with us and what we have done. It has to do with what God has done for us. And it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship with God and relationship with each other. And so here, at the end of his letter to the Galatians, Paul focuses a little bit more on our relationship with each other. We're in Galatians chapter 6, starting with verse 1. My friends, Paul writes, if anyone is detected in a transgression, if, if anyone is found to be in the midst of sin, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a, such a one in spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted, but bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think that they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work, then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride, for all must carry their own loads." Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap, a harvest time, we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. All right, now, on first reading, in a way, it, it almost seems like Paul is throwing a whole bunch of little, uh, you know, by the ways at the end of his letter. By the way, don't forget to do this, and don't forget to do this, and, and remember this. But really, they, I think, do all fit together in his theme on grace. Now, I think there's really two ways uh, that we can look at this passage. The first is probably what we would consider the more, the more positive aspect of this passage, the one that we're perhaps more willing to consider in terms of bearing one another's burdens. 
Now, you might know that this past week, I spent most of the week, in fact, more of the week than I had expected to, uh, up in the Boston area because our oldest daughter, Jenna, uh, got a job teaching second grade in Lynn, Massachusetts. And so in a sort of very short period of time, uh, we all had to find her an apartment uh, and uh, get her up there and get her uh, all set up as a teacher and get her to human resources and all that sort of stuff. So. In this past week, since last Sunday, we left Sunday afternoon until Thursday afternoon, we were not only setting up her apartment, but setting up her classroom. This was something that was much more involved than I had ever imagined. And quite frankly, it was something that she could not have done all by herself. And I think that's what, what Paul is getting at here is that because he, he seems to contradict himself in this passage because on the one hand he says, bear one another's burdens. And then later in that same paragraph he says, everyone is responsible for their own load. So which is it, Paul? Well, what are you talking about? On the one hand we're supposed to bear each other's burdens. On the other hand, we're all supposed to carry our own load. Well, yes. I don't think that it really is contradictory. There are times when our load is something we cannot carry ourselves. We need help. And we should be committed to stepping in and helping one another when that is the case. Jana could not have done everything that needed to be done this week by herself. She needed help, and not just for me. There were a number of people who stepped in to give her the help she needed along the way because she couldn't do it on her own. Now, come Tuesday, she officially starts. The kids show up on Wednesday. At that point, her talents, her skills, her gifts, and her training are going to have to kick in because she's going to have to teach that class. She's going to have to carry that. You see, we're, we're all called. We're, we're all given something by God that he w- is calling us to do. And we are responsible for that calling. Now, he has gifted us. He's, he's given us the gifts and the talents and the things that we need. And he will give us the resources if we ask for them and if we're doing that which he called us to do. But sometimes along the way, there are parts that we can't do on our own, that we need help carrying. And that's when we need others to step in and help us to carry. And that's really what grace is. I mean, when we're talking about God's grace, isn't that what it is? God stepping in and doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And we all know that there are times in our lives when we hit those places where whatever we're dealing with is more than we can handle by ourselves. And we need somebody or some bodies to come alongside us and to help us to carry that burden. Now there are two different words that Paul uses in this passage. The first really means to carry or to bear one another's burdens, that physical things that are too heavy for one person to carry. A burden which one needs help to carry. The second one where he said everyone is responsible for their own load, he uses a different word there. And it's interesting, that word usually is used in a more metaphorical way. It's it's not an actual burden, it's not an actual weight, but it is something burdensome to someone and is often used in relation to the law. The law which which we are unable to carry, and yet which we 
have some responsibility for. And this is where the other aspect of this passage, I think, comes in, the one that we're not as comfortable with, the one that is harder for us to do and we'd really rather not consider it. And it's really what he starts with in this passage. If someone is found in the midst of sin, you who have the Spirit, you who are are part of the, the body of Christ, you who are filled with God's Spirit, should do whatever you can, whatever is in your power to restore that person. Being careful, of course, not to do it in such a way that you put yourself in danger of falling into temptation. You see, the church, generally speaking, is really terrible at this. When when people are discovered in sin, we tend to, to become shocked and outraged that this person that we, we welcomed into our midst, this person that we trusted and, and we served alongside of has done something that, that we can't quite cope with. And so generally speaking, when those things happen, that person leaves the church. Well, really, that person is sort of welcomed <laughs> to leave the church. There is very rarely this concept of restoration. And yet, as we talked a little bit about last week, we, we like to, to clean ourselves up. We, we like to look good on Sundays to, to pretend at least that our lives are all together. We've got it. We're, everything's great with us when most of us, at least for ourselves, know our lives aren't all together. Our lives aren't perfect. Our lives, in at least some aspects, are, are falling apart. But we don't want to admit that. I've actually been convicted myself this week. And I'm sure that there will be a number of different reactions to this. But many of you will remember that a couple of years ago, we had a member of this church, a longtime member of this church, an active member of this church, who was arrested in a very public way. It hit the news media, and for at least a 24-hour cycle, it was all you heard about. And it scared many of us. Now, thankfully, it didn't involve anything that had taken place here at the church or in any of our programs. But we were shocked. And quite frankly, I have to admit, at the time, I was angry. I mean, the the thought begins to go through your mind, how could this person do this? I mean, and, and didn't they know how it would affect us? Didn't they know what negative publicity it would, it would rain down upon us? And we managed to navigate that. But in the midst of that, we left this individual, this this member of our congregation, this active and loyal member of our congregation, we essentially abandoned. Now, you can say he brought this upon himself. It was, it was his choice, his decision, and you are absolutely right. But how many of us If some of the things that we thought or the things that we had done were made public would be in any better shape. For most of us, it's just that nobody knows. And isn't somebody 
who has made a choice like that? Isn't somebody who has ruined their lives, isn't that somebody that, that needs us, that needs some network of love and support? Not that we approve of what was done, but that's what Paul is saying in this passage, is that we are all sinners saved by grace. And that doesn't mean that we, we don't continue to struggle with sin. But when one, of our, one in our midst is caught in the midst of sin, Paul doesn't say, cut them off, abandon them. And I have to admit, as, as the pastor here, part of my thinking was, I just want him and the situation to go away. One, because it looks bad. It looks bad for our congregation that this happened with one of our members. But to be quite honest, the second reason is it's just too hard to deal with. I don't know how to deal with it. With, with the various restrictions that have been put on him, I don't know what what helping him would look like. I'm not sure he could ever really come back to church here on a regular basis. And the whole situation is, is just hard. It's difficult. But does that mean that we shouldn't try? And I have to admit, that's what it has meant. We just moved on. But in reading this passage and in, in, in immersing myself in the last five weeks in this concept of grace, God has convicted me that that's not the way that we should treat one another. Now, some of you are not ready for that. So some of you, and there are good reasons. There's personal histories. There's other experiences that just are not, at this point, going to allow you to go there. And that's okay. But there are some of us who I think need to step out in faith. We need to come together and, and contact this individual and find out if there is some way that we can be a support and encouragement, that we can restore him, if not to regular participation in our midst, at least help him to put some of the pieces of his life back together. That's, I think, what, what Paul is getting at here. And it's hard. It's difficult. That's why we really don't like this. When people do things that we find uncomfortable, we just, we just want them to go away. But that's not what grace calls us to. We have been forgiven. While we were in the midst of sin, while we were in the midst of whatever it is for us, while we were ignoring God's word and doing whatever it is we felt like doing, Christ came. Christ came for you. Even though at the time you had no interest in him, he came, and he died for you. But the slightly disturbing and frightening thing is, he came, and he died for everyone that you will ever lay eyes upon. 
because he loves them. And even though they may not do things that we like, God sees value in them. And he loves them and he expects us to offer them the same grace that he has offered to us. in the midst of their sin that we would step out in faith and love them anyway. In a few minutes, we're going to gather around this table, this table that reminds us of of God's incredible love for us, that reminds us of Jesus' body given for us, his real, physical, human body that was tortured for us. The cup that reminds reminds us of his blood poured out for us. You know that one of the discussions within the church these days is whether or not there are multiple ways to God. And Christianity is just just one of many options. But this table is what it comes down to for me. If there are other options, then Christ did not need to die. If there are other options, he didn't have to come at all. If there are other ways, then Christ's death is meaningless. Some say that that is, that's too narrow. That that's not, that's not welcoming enough. Well, certainly the church may have made it seem that way. But what Christ did, he did for all. His grace and his forgiveness are open to all. There is no qualification other than faith. If we trust in him, he welcomes us. And because of grace, he welcomes us where we are, in the midst of our messy lives. He doesn't insist that we clean ourselves up first because he knows that we can't. He welcomes us just as we are and says, come and follow me and I'll clean you up. If you know your situation, if you know your life, you know it's going to take a little while. But come and follow me. That's grace. And I think we need to begin to understand that grace, that we can better communicate it to the world around us who desperately needs love and acceptance and grace. They need to know that God loves them in the midst of their sin. Now understand, that doesn't mean that they're not sinners doesn't mean that God says your sin is okay. But God loves you in the midst of it. And he has taken action to forgive your sin. That's what we need to communicate. God's love and grace and forgiveness. We need to understand it for ourselves. and communicate it to others, that we might bring him the honor and the glory that he deserves, and do it all in Jesus' name. Amen.